work. We have been covering uh, is in the last uh, 18 weeks our fundamental beliefs. Uh, we have been doing this and I am very happy and content with the report that I have heard from, from all of you. Uh, at different times, you have spoken highly and you have uh, just, or not spoken highly, but just encouraged me in the fact that we're going through this uh, series, just revisiting all of our fundamental beliefs. And there's a reason for this, and really the, at, the get, at the center of it all, why, we, why I wanted to go through this was simply because the only way we can see God's work in our life is if we understand what he's all about. The fundamental beliefs are not, it's not a creed, it's not a, it's, they're not doctrines. They're just simply the way that we have best understood God's will for our life. And last week we looked at the spirits and the gifts that the spirit has and we saw that the three reasons why we receive gifts of the spirit is to protect God's people from all debauchery. Amen on that church? It helps you and as we have looked a couple months ago, it helps you be held in check because if it's not for God's grace, you and I would be worse than what we are. God actually helps you be in check because you could get worse. But by God's grace, he allows you to be where you are so that you can learn how to be better. So you can be more like Jesus. The second thing, it helps God's people mature. Come on, church, let's be honest. We all sit here. We all enjoy Sabbath school. We all enjoy the sermons. We all enjoy all these things that we do. And we talk a good talk when it comes to our Bible knowledge. But how are we in our spiritual life? Are we adult-like in like, the way that we talk about doctrines? Or is our spiritual life still in the infant state? How do we react when someone cuts us off in the road? What is the first thing that you think of when someone says something to you? Do you initially go into the defense and you go into attack mode? You go into a way to preserve or to protect you because you think that someone is out against you? Or do you see a good in someone else? These are all signs of whether you are a spiritual in your spirituality or whether you are immature in your spiritual walk. But I think, and this is the, has been the emphasis of the sermons, the third point here, the third reason for why the Spirit has given us gifts is to unite God's people. You see, all of us, will not survive if we remain separate, if we remain silos in our faith. Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 10 tells us, uh, chapter 10 verse 25 tells us that we ought to meet together, not like others have done because we need to encourage one another. We actually need to meet with one another because we need to push ourselves into good works. Because we're not capable of doing it ourselves. Jeremiah uh, 3 tells us, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 17 tells us that our hearts are beyond all things deceitful. So we can't do it our, on our own. We need each other. So God sends the gifts of the Spirit. But there is one specific gift that God has given his church. And uh, if we're going to turn, uh, we'll stay in Amos, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul tells us that there is one specific spiritual gift that he wants his church to understand and to pursue and to actually desire above all things. He says, pursue love. Amen to that, right? And earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may what? Prophesy. Am I speaking to God's prophetic church? Right? This is an important 
aspect of our identity. We are a people of the book. We are a people that are called to prophesy, and not just once, not twice, but to continually prophesy again. The gift of the prophecy is an important aspect of our church. And sadly, I am just going to say this, there are many of us that are rejecting this specific gift. We have failed to understand the purpose of the gift of prophecy and its usefulness. And let me be honest with you, church. Not just its usefulness, but your need of it every day. Your well-being in, in your spiritual life, in your journey in church, depends upon whether you will embrace the gift of prophecy or not. The gift was given for a specific purpose. And its intent is still the same intent that I've been highlighting every day, every Sabbath. This is part of God's plan to make sure you make it to heaven. God's mission, God's work, his agenda is simply to save you from your sin and to have you in heaven. And the gift of prophecy it's one of those avenues that he does it. And church, you cannot do it if you reject it. It is a full package. It's not, it's not a mix and match with God. If you remember, this is something I was not ready to even share at all, but if you remember in the sanctuary, in the wilderness sanctuary, what, does, what is it that Moses was allowed to describe or to choose what sort of decoration in the, in the sanctuary. Did Moses pick the decorations? Did he choose the colors? Did he choose the furnishing? Was he even allowed to make any decision in terms of what happened inside, what, what, what took place, or not took place, what made the sanctuary the sanctuary? God gave full instruction what type of material, what type of color, what type of decoration, what type of what, everything. And you know what? God took 12 chapters to specifically detail how his sanctuary must be. 12 chapters repeated twice. Do you think that's important? The sanctuary was God's way of saving people. You know what the message is? A, a lot of people try to decipher what all these little furnishings and all this stuff. You know what it means simply? God did not allow you to make, put any input in the plan of salvation. It is God's doing and his doing alone, and you have no say in it. You want it, you take the whole thing. If you don't want it, just walk away. It's not a mix and match. Same thing goes with the gifts of, 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 of prophecy. We are called to desire and to pursue this specific gift because this gift is what's going to help us get through the last days. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 says, Be appalled, all heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed how many evils? Two evils. They have what? What's the first one? Forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And what's the second one? Hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold no water. Two sins. And church, you and I commit this all the time. We reject the source of life. In our, Bible, uh, in our Sabbath school lesson, one of the things that we learned was that the disciples said, Master, we have no bread. And then Jesus asked the, the final question, do you still not understand? Didn't I provide bread for everyone? Was I not the source of life for everyone around me? And did you not see me provide the bread for everyone? Why are you saying I have no, you have no bread? 
You see, our flaws, our faults is, in fact, that we choose when we want Jesus and when we don't want Jesus. Sometimes we say, yeah, I'm for Jesus. And sometimes we act like we don't want Jesus. And in turn, what we do is we say, you know what? I know something better, God. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to build a cistern, a little well, and I'm going to do it for myself. And when I need you, God, I'm going to come over here with my little cup. I'm going to fill from the living water over here, and I'm going to walk over here and fill my little broken cistern over here. Let me ask you, church, how long do you think you can sustain that type of lifestyle? Have you seen, I, I love when, when my kids play with water and they're, they're like, you know, they're, they, they try to put it in cups and you see them walking and it's just spilling everywhere. By the time they get to the table, there's like a quarter left in the cup. That's what we do with God's blessings. Instead of staying here at the source and saying, I'm going to live here forever, we say, no, 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 let me just come over here with my shaky hands and I'm going to fill this broken cistern that's leaking and now I need to go back there again. And next thing you know, we spend our lives in this back and forth, going to the living waters to fill broken cisterns that can't contain anything, so we got to go back. And we go back and forth. And guess what? That's what Satan wants you to do. When you're wasting your time trying to sustain your life, you can't see the mission of God in front of you. inherently, not because you want to, but inherently you have to start thinking about yourself because if not, then you're not going to live long enough. You're in self-preservation mode. You're constantly having to go and get water because if not, you're going to run dry and what are you going to have left? Nothing. But the moment that you say, you know what? I want Jesus and I want to stay there. It's the moment that you can actually begin to live a free life to do ministry. And let me tell you, the gift of prophecy was given to specifically inoculate this problem. The gift of prophecy throughout Scripture has always been the way that God wakes his people up from slumber. God's people have always gone and, and done the same thing. They rejected the living water, built broken cisterns, and they live in this empty, vicious cycle, this back and forth. And the gift of prophecy is the one that calls people out of that lifestyle. But if you reject, if you don't accept, if you don't embrace that specific aspect of the gift of the Spirit, how are you going to stop? What is there to make you stop? Isaiah 4 verse 1 says, And seven women shall take hold of one man in, the de in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. Salvation by works much? Oh God, I just want to be called a Christian, but don't worry God, I'll provide everything for myself. Don't worry, God, I want to be in heaven, but I'll make my path. We do this every day. We may not say it out loud like that, but we practice it. That's what we do on a daily basis, and we're living empty lives because we're not abiding at the source of living water. Hosea chapter 2 says, for their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. She, for she said, I will go after my lovers who, gi uh, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, and who lavished her with silver and gold which they used for Baal. church, we do this. How many blessings have God given you and you've squandered away and 
claim that it was because of your own doing. Oh, my work, my career path, my investment choices, the one who I'm trusting with my portfolio. It's my doing. I knew how to play it all. Was it really? Or was God's favor upon you the whole time? And church, the only way that you're going to wake up from this, this stupor that we're in is through the gift of, spirit, uh, of prophecy. The gift of prophecy was organized to help us be free from this trap. I love this quote. It's been said in different ways. But here's how Blaise Pascal said this many, many, many years ago. What else? does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once a man in a true happiness of which all that now remain is empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there to help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can only be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. All of that to say, Blaise Pascal simply said, we all have a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts. And we go day in and day out trying to fill it with something that is not the infinite God. We always try to do our best to see how can I satisfy my craving. And Blaze is simply telling us, all you need is God himself. That's the answer. Stop playing this game going between the living waters and broken cisterns. Just stay at the living waters. Why would you go over there? We all have a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts that needs to be satisfied. And the only way you can bring an end to this vicious cycle is if you abide with God. You see, Jesus says, if I, when I be lifted up from the earth, what will he do? I will draw all men to myself. You see, the solution, the answer, it's not in you. You can't do it. You can't bring yourself to Jesus. It is impossible, church, to bring yourself to Jesus. It is impossible, church, to even choose Jesus for yourself. You need God's grace to even give you the ability to ask for forgiveness. The fact that Kobe was able to even say, I want to be baptized, shows that God has already been working in his life to make that decision. Yeah. And I, when I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. That is the role, the role, the gift of the spirit of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is simply that, emphasizing Christ above all else so that people can finally be set free of their vicious cycle that they're in. I'm going to read to you this from Faith, uh, Faith and Works, page 107. When the sinner has a view of the matchless charms of Jesus, sin no longer looks attractive to him, for he beholds the chiefest among 10,000. The one altogether lovely. He realizes by personal experience the power of the gospel, whose vastness of design is equaled only by its preciousness of purpose. The gift of prophecy was given to you and to me to learn more about Christ's love. The reason why God's people continued in sin, and even to this day, God's people continue in sin, is because they have not fallen in love with Christ. 
The problem in all of our lives right now is that we just don't love Jesus enough. But how can you love, how can you fall in love with someone if it's not that someone charmed you? The reason why I love Jessica is because she charmed me. She wooed me in. And I said, yes, yes, honey, please. The same thing goes with her. Why does she love me? Because I wooed her back. I was like, yes, honey, come on, let's just come and stay with me. Never leave me. That's how it happens. Come on, Terry, right? Terry, Melanie, no, no, no. Ooh. We need to hear from Christ. His words are lovely. His words are charming. I don't even know if I have this verse here, but let's go to Hosea. Just go to Hosea really quick. I, I don't think you understand the work that God did. Let me see. Is, is, it, is it? Nope, nope. It's not there. Hosea. I, 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 again, I'm not sure if I have it up there or not, but chapter 2, verse 6, God is done with Israel. She's played the whore, played the harlot, he's done. Verse 6, God says, therefore, chapter 2, Hosea chapter 2, verse 6, therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her. Verse 9, notice now what he says, therefore I will take back my grain in its due time, and my wine in its season. I will take away the my wool and my flax, which cover her nakedness. And even in verse 11, listen what he even says. I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, and her Sabbaths. Yes, church. You keep playing the, the harlot with God. He will take the joy of Sabbath away from you. Because it's not yours, it's his. We, we see how God begins to compound and therefore I will do this against you. Therefore I will do this against you. And he, this says, and he says, therefore a third time. And I don't know about you, but my mom, if she had to say my name three times, that never happened because I'm here, I'm here alive. I never let her get to the third time. But God says, therefore a third time. Verse 14. If y'all know what I'm talking about, you know that it's not going to be good the third time. But listen to what God says. Therefore, behold, I will, what does your Bible read? I will what? I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness, the place where I propose to her. I will speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor, this is where Achan was slain, a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt, where she said yes. God's purpose is to save you, church. Jesus is trying to bathe you, shower you, cover you, clothe you, whatever you, whatever the scripture you want to use with his love. And he's determined to win you back. He's on full court press to win you over. In heavenly places, search the Bibles, for it tells you of Jesus. I want you to read the Bible and see the matchless charms of Jesus. I want you to fall in love with the man of Calvary. So that at every step you can say to the world, his ways are ways of pleasantness. And all his paths are peace. Church, we understand that God has gifted us the gift of prophecy and throughout the ages throughout history he has blessed his people 
by raising men and women that have called their attention of God's people back to the love of Christ. To see the man of Calvary and to fall in love with him. And church, in our church, we know that this has been manifested through the writings of Ellen White. And church, again, I'm going to tell you, and I'm standing here on this one firm, your wellness, your development in your faith, depends on whether you accept God's full grace. And that includes the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is here simply to call you back to fall in love with Jesus. How can you say yes to Christ if you have not been drawn to his love? This is what she says, I have a work of great responsibility to do, to impart by pen and voice the instruction given to me, not alone to Seventh-day Adventists, but to the world. I have published my books, large and small, and some of, the, uh, some of these have been translated into several languages. This is my work, listen church, to open the scriptures to others as God has opened them to me. gift of prophecy is here to encourage us to go back to the word. To fall in love with the man of Calvary. To fall in love with him and to let his love win us over. It is my duty first to present Bible principles. Then, unless there is a decided conscientious reform made by those whose cases have been presented before me, I must appeal to them personally. And here is the thing, church. It's the last quote that I'm going to read to you today. You're not familiar with the scriptures. If you, have, if you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because, of you, it's because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple, direct testimonies, calling your attention to the words of inspiration which you have neglected to obey, and urging you to fashion your life in accordance to its pure and elevated teachings. Church, in the same words of Ellen White, I recommend to you this book. This is the only source of power. And if you have not heard, if you haven't figured it out in all my sermons that I have preached, this is what I want you to, uh, to strive and to reach and study all the time. Your well-being, your, your, your happiness, your joy, the, the, the peace, the, all the things that we're all looking for is right in here. This is what you need. Don't forsake it. Accept it. Let it work through you, in you, and out of you to bless others. This is, this is the goal. Let's take time, church. Let's make that covenant with God and say, yes, I will allow your love letters. This is what this is. The Bible is God's love letter to you. I will read your love letters to me. I will let your word draw me to you. I will let your word help me fall in love with you. This church is what you need. This is what I need. And church, if we stick to this book, we will make it to heaven. There is no doubt in my mind at all. It's not a what if. It's a when. Church, let's take time to study our word. God has given us, God has blessed us through the word. Melanie, if you can uh, join him here. God has given us the writings of Ellen White, and not just that, but fa uh, so much more. All we need to do is make sure that we go back to scripture. At this time, let us stand up for our closing hymn.